He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Uh, when I was studying for this, I, I started studying the faithfulness of God and kind of went back and forth on what this, this sermon was about, but I believe God has directed me this direction. The title of this is A Sure Foundation in God's Faithfulness. A Sure Foundation in God's Faithfulness. So the first question I would ask tonight is, what does it mean that God is faithful? What does it mean that God is faithful? I've preached on Jesus' name, Faithful and True, um, and we've, we've heard many sermons on God's faithfulness. There is some depth to it beyond just thinking, well, he does what he says he will do. That's usually the, the immediate response, and that's truth. That is what he said he will do. But there is a faithfulness to God that goes deeper than that. And that's what I kind of want to study tonight. So this would be a little bit more of a study getting to Scripture and some thoughts on God and his character, his holy character and his faithfulness. I think we could all say God is faithful to us. Everyone here would say that. He's a faithful God. But how does that apply to us? What does that affect in our lives as Christians? And I would even ask, does each person have their own definition of God's faithfulness? They may have their own thoughts and their own ideas about God's faithfulness. And it may be based on different sermon or different verses. But let's go into what the Bible says tonight. We're going to go through some verses. We're going to go through some thoughts on areas of God's faithfulness, that sure foundation we have in God's faithfulness. Before we start, let's pray. Uh, Father God, Lord, please help me. Please help me, Lord, to share the thoughts that you've given. And, and Father, may it be for your glory and for the encouragement of my brothers and sisters tonight, Lord. Father, guide my words. Help me so that people leave here praising you and thanking you. Lord, because you're a good God that is faithful, you are a sure foundation. And Lord, that is based on your holiness and your faithfulness. Lord, uh, again, I, I beg you for help tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so, you know, I'm going to give a couple illustrations of maybe ways we err in thinking about God's faithfulness. Sometimes we may equate answers to prayer with God's faithfulness. If I'm going to pray and he answers my prayer, then God's faithful. Well, what happens if he doesn't answer the prayer? What happens if the answer is a no through silence? Does that mean God is unfaithful? It really honestly depends on the prayer. How are you praying? What are you praying for? Are you, are you praying in God's will? So you can't equate God's faithfulness to does he answer all your prayers? God's faithfulness isn't measured that way. Sometimes we may equate him to doing something our way, the way we think it should be done. We see something happening, maybe in the world or in someone's life, and we think God should do this thing this certain way. But when he doesn't, is he no longer faithful? We may equate him doing it the way we want him to as being faithful. Those are just some thoughts on maybe we're not really grasping the faithfulness of God. It's not just doing things our way, not just answering our prayers whenever we, we tell him we want something or ask for something. Our God's a sovereign God. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And God is absolutely, utterly faithful. Every area in the character of God, he is faithful. When we talk about God being faithful, it speaks to the very core, the core of God's character, centered in God. Faithfulness has to do with being reliable, firmness, stability, trustworthiness, trueness to one's word, and dependability. And that's our God. There, is, there isn't a, a single man on this earth that's 100% faithful. There's none. Only God is 100% faithful. He's faithful to himself 
and he's faithful to us. And that's the thought I want to point out a little bit more so tonight. He is faithful to himself. He is faithful to us, but he's faithful to himself. He is unchanging and perfection. So he will never not be faithful. He will always be faithful. And God's faithfulness cannot be defined by us receiving everything we ask for in all situations going in our favor. I said that, but it's almost a prosperity thought, a prosperity gospel. If things go your way and you give things, you'll get things. And it's a messed up way to think of God's faithfulness. Often we're promised suffering, persecution, hard times, trials, walking through those valleys. Yet, God is still faithful. It doesn't mean that God isn't faithful when we're going through the valley. That's often when he shows he's faithful to us, shows his character. So I'm going to jump right into it. I have five thoughts tonight, and I'll try to go through them really quick. God is faithful to his holy character. That's the first thought. God is faithful to his holy character, who he is. God has various attributes. He's holy, he's just, he's righteous, he's truthful, he's loving. There's many attributes. God is holy. Psalm 145, verse 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. So I want to point out God is faithful to his holy character. He is unchanging. He will not act in an unholy way. He will not act in an unjust way. He will not act in an unrighteous way. He will not lie. To act contrary to his holy character would mean he was unfaithful. So what I'm trying to point out with this is God is faithful. Separate us out of this. God is faithful to his holy character. He's righteous. He's pure. He's holy. Everything he does is right and good. He is faithful to that character, those attributes. God has given us, people, humans, moral standards based on his holiness. We have the Ten Commandments. We have God's word through the entire thing tells us what we should and shouldn't do. It's the many thou shouts and thou shalt nots. God will not be unfaithful to his holy moral standard. God is faithful to the word he's given us, to the moral standard, to the commands, the law he's given us. And he's given those commands for our blessing and our good. If we don't follow him, he has told us there's consequences for breaking those commands. So God has... This is one area that he remains faithful to his holy character in giving us standards that we can live holy lives by. And God will always remain faithful to his holy character. He will not accept wickedness. He does not accept wickedness, and he will not. Psalm, if you can, please turn to Psalm chapter 5, verse 4. Psalm chapter 5, verse 4. It says, For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. And you see that. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. Verse 4 it says, Neither shall evil dwell with thee. God will not accept wickedness in heaven. And there is judgment for sin. This is all part of God's holy character. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, it says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Revelation 21, 8 says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the Murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. This is part of God's holy character. Judgment for sin, the fact that he will not dwell with wickedness. He will not dwell with evil. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. 
that is part of God's holy character. And he will remain faithful to that holy character. Now, I, I've preached on Jesus' name in Revelation 19. I love the passage. I love all of that. It says, in Revelation 19, 11, it says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Now, and I, I've thought this way, but often we think this way, where we look at faithful and true, and we immediately personalize that. Where immediately we go, well, yes, he's faithful and he's true to me. But the context, it dawned on me, the context of the passage is his judgment. He's riding out of heaven to judge, to, to, to wipe out the armies and to, to show the wrath of God. When you realize this is not something personalized at us, the faithful and true, it is his character, it is who he is. He's faithful to his holy character. When you apply it to the context, he is showing judgment to this world. He's riding out of heaven to judge the armies of the Antichrist. He's going to destroy them. He's faithful to his holiness. So there's a personal aspect to it. He's faithful to us. But he's faithful to his holy character in that he's coming to judge the world and rule from Jerusalem with a rod. So Jesus is faithful to us, but it also describes his character, his holiness. And that's a thought I hadn't thought of before. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. That is part of that faithful and true. So hopefully I'm not losing everyone with this. Trying to, I'm trying to establish... God's faithfulness applies to us personally in a relationship and how he works and deals with us. But God's faithfulness is deeper even than that, in that it's ingrained in his character. It is who he is. He will remain faithful to his attributes, to who he has shown he is, and his holiness. That's his purity, his righteousness, how he's set apart, how he will judge sin. He remains faithful to that. God's faithfulness to his character is a sure foundation when we may be facing the unknown. And I'm going to try to point back to the sure foundation in God's faithfulness with each point. But God's faithfulness is his character in, pardon me, God's faithfulness to his holy character is a sure foundation when we may be facing the unknown. There's a ton of unknowns right now. Just looking at the world and the way it's going and things that are happening if you watch the news, and I don't think it's a good idea to sit and watch the news because it's just going to make you depressed probably and confused with how crazy the world is. But when you look at this world, we're facing the unknown. There is an aspect, I should say, we're facing the unknown in this world. How crazy can it get? How insane can it get? How twisted and upside down and wrong can it get? That's really where it's going. And everything's speeding up. It's getting worse and worse, faster and faster. There are certain places they don't ca take cash anymore. We're moving towards a cashless society. They just, they refuse cash. I mean, it's across the board. They're trying to push another whole COVID vaccine thing and all kinds. We don't, we face the unknown. There are things we don't know. And Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, it says this. The secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. And what I want to point out with that is God's character, his holy character, is a sure foundation. He will be faithful to that. And that's a sure foundation. Because when we don't know what's going on, God knows the secrets. He knows where this world's going. He knows what's going to happen. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God. But the things revealed to, to, which are revealed belong to us. So we have God's word. We have what he's given us. We stand on that. We stand on God's faithfulness. We can depend on God to act according to his character. And this is something to, to rely on, to have faith in, is God's character. He is faithful to who he says he will be. When we don't understand something... Go back to God's character. When you don't understand it, when it's confusing, when it's messed up, go back to God's character. 
Who is he? He's a loving God. He's a just God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. He will be faithful to that holiness. So he is holiness, truth, and love. So the first thought was God is faithful to his holy character. Here's the second one. God is faithful to his word. And when I say his word, I mean God's word, the Bible. God's word is truth. We have verses that say that. John 17, 17, thy word is truth. We have to realize God's word is truth. And I believe everyone here believes that. Absolutely. By faith, we accept that this is truth. And we live by it. God will keep his word. And I I preached on Jesus' name, faithful and true. What he says he will do. That's absolutely truth. He will keep his word. So it is impossible for God to lie. He will not lie. So he's given us many, many promises in his word. And that is something to have faith in. He is faithful to his word, so he will give us promises. 2 Peter 1.4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But that great and precious promises, I want to point some of those out real quick before we move on. I think it's a neat thought that we have great and precious promises. And if I, well, I won't do this, but if I just ask some people, what's a great and precious promise? I think everyone here could name many of them. But here's some that just kind of stood out to me, and I thought they were neat, so I'll just list them real quick here. He will be a guide in death. A guide in death. That's interesting. That's neat to me. Psalm 48, 14 says, for this God is our God forever and ever. He will be our guide even unto death. That's fascinating. Perfect peace. He promises, one of those great and precious promises is perfect peace. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That's a promise. Perfect peace. Rest for our souls. Here's another great and precious promise. And may I say, rest for our souls? This is important today. Is if you're looking around seeing what's happening in the world, we need rest for our souls. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 29 says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. That's one of those great and precious promises. Here's another one. He promises to be with us in trouble. Isaiah 43, 2. It says, when thou passest through the waters, I I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. That's a great and precious promise. He promises to care for us. That one I think is amazing, that he will care for us individually, our, our soul, our spirit. First Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Salvation is another great and precious promise. Salvation, everlasting life. That's John three sixteen. Anyone can quote that one here. He promises kindness to us through Christ for the ages to come. That is is a great and precious promise that we don't even understand. What is that kindness for the ages to come? That's Ephesians 2, 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. That boggles my mind. And it's a great mystery what we're going to be in eternity, what we're going to be doing, what is our place in the heavenly realm. And that God is going to show his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus for the ages to come. Fascinating. That's a great and precious promise. He will be our father. We will be his sons and daughters. There's another great and precious promise. And that goes back to our scripture reading today. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. 
sons and daughters to God. That is a great and precious promise. I just wanted to name a few of them. I, I found there was a list. It was 5,467 promises. And I couldn't even, I couldn't even get into the, the whole thing because it was loading. But we have so many great and precious promises because of God's faithfulness to his word. God knew that he would have to keep his promise if he gave it. And he gave it. He gave us one promise after another, after another, and he will keep them all. And if you think about that, how can you keep, just if you're just a person, trying to keep five promises, trying to keep ten promises, keeping them in order in your head, that's why it's probably not good to promise anything. But God, I mean, if that list is true, 5,467, just that list that was there, he keeps all those with every single one of us. And all the others that weren't listed and, and everything else, our God is an amazing God. Great and precious promises. So to really have that foundation in God's word, God is faithful to his word, to really have that foundation, we've got to understand a few things. God's word is truth. I presented that. God's word is truth. I believe everyone here would agree with that. God gave his word. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So God gave his word. His word is truth. God's word is preserved. And this is where some people trip up. Is the, the idea, the doctrine of preservation. God's word is preserved. That's why we can trust it. If it's not preserved, then how can you trust it? It could be wrong. Psalm, Psalm 12, 6 and 7 says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So God's word is preserved. And then God is faithful to fulfill all promises. That's why God's word is something, is a sure foundation. Because he will keep his word. It's his it's truth. It's his truth. He gave it. It's preserved. And now we can live by it because he promises all these things and he will keep his word. So God's faithfulness to his word makes his word a sure foundation for our lives. First, his character does. His holy character. Next, his word. Here's the next one. God is faithful to salvation's plan. So, again, going back to the beginning there, I I said, often when we think of God's faithfulness, we think of how he's faithful and what he says to us he will do. These are certain things that might be off that track a little bit. It's all that he, everything that I'm presenting, he said he would do. And he's given us in his word. But God's character, he's faithful to his holy character. He's faithful to his word. He's faithful to salvation's plan. That's his plan, not our plan. It's the plan that he decided on, that he planned and that he's doing. God has offered to save mankind from pending judgment for their sin. He has offered to reconcile mankind to himself through Jesus the Son. That is God's salvation plan. And he remains faithful to that plan. That plan's not changing. He will not change that plan. He offered his own son to pay the penalty we owed in our place. Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's offered to all. And that's Revelation twenty two seventeen. You know, the Bible records how God has progressively revealed himself more and more to mankind. We can see that from the pre-flood to the Old Testament to New Testament. And we can even see how Jesus in the millennial reign will be reigning on earth. He will be able to be seen by everybody. So progressively, we've seen more and more how God's revealed his plan, revealed who he is to mankind over the ages and dispensations. God the Son is the only one who could satisfy God's faithfulness to his holy character and faithfulness to his love. Because God is a loving God too. Jesus was the only one that could fulfill that. He's the only one. He is the only provision for sin. He's it. Anybody that adds anything else to it, takes away from it, says there's another way, is utterly, absolutely wrong. He is our only hope. If 
if he offered, if God the Father offered another way to go to heaven and be reconciled to himself, he would be unfaithful. Because he has said, John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that's truth. Jesus, the person of Jesus, is the faithfulness of God incarnate. Faithful and true, it's his very name. He is faithful. And Jesus really fulfills the holiness of God's character and the love in God's character, of God's character. God is love. God's faithfulness to salvation's plan gives us a peace that passes understanding. The fact that we have salvation, that we have someone that paid for our, we don't have to work for salvation. Jesus did the work. That gives us a peace that none of the other religions anywhere offer. This is a peace that passes understanding. We watch these things happen in the news, the craziness, the, the viruses, all the different things coming down, and we have a peace knowing that our times are in the Lord's hand, as David said. His times are in the Lord's hands. God knows the day we are born and the day we're going to die. And we can try to change it all we want, but God sets the day on either one of those. We can't change it. He will set the day. The wicked in this world have no peace. But we do, through all the hardships and trials, we can have an, a peace that passes understanding. And I would explain that peace, but it passes understanding, so I can't explain it. But it is a peace where you can look at these things, the world being on, fired, on fire, and you can just go, wow, that's interesting. You know, I got to do this, I got to do this. And you move on. It doesn't bother you because the Lord is our foundation. He's our protection. He's our help. And we know where we're going because of him, not because of what we're doing, but because of who he is and what he's already done. So that's a praise the Lord. He is a sure foundation. Christ is that sure foundation. So number four, God is faithful to his divine plan. Here's another one. So God is faithful to his holy character. God is faithful to his word. God is faithful to salvation's plan. And God is also faithful to his divine plan. And salvation is part of the divine plan, but I'm trying to hit it a, a maybe a bigger one that we don't understand. So, and I, hopefully I'll make this clear. Nothing's an accident. For us, nothing's an accident. God knows what we're doing when we do it. God knows what enters our lives. God knows our financial struggles. God knows the sicknesses, the illnesses. God knows the accident we're in. God knows the injuries we have. All the things that we encounter in our lives, it's not an accident. God has a divine plan, which is a great mystery to us. He has a divine plan for each one of us. He has a divine plan through time. He has a divine plan for eternity. And these things exceed our understanding. But what we can understand a little bit more is the divine plan for our lives. He has a plan for each one of us, what, we're gonna, what he wants us to do, what he plans for us to do. And here's a thought, and I, I take comfort in this. God knows the fullness of time. We have at least two different, there's many verses talk about fullness of time. But two verses I want to point out. Galatians 4, 4. And you can turn there, please. Galatians 4, 4. There's two, I think, big ones where the fullness of time really applies in this instance to God's faithfulness. Galatians 4, 4. And it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So this is talking about when Jesus was born. God the Father knew the fullness of time when Jesus should be born. He knew when to send Jesus. Out of all the thousands of years, out of all the time, all the generations of people, he knew exactly the time to do that. Now, Romans 11.25 is the other side of this. Romans 11.25, it says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, 
That blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We're waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in and then our Lord's going to return. And that's when Israel is going to be restored. God knew the fullness when to send Jesus the first time. And he knew the fullness, God the Father knew the fullness when to send God the Son the first time. And when to send God the Son the second time. He knows those times. They're not accidents. He is faithful to his divine plan. He knows our times. I mentioned that. He knows the day we're born, the day we die. It's not an accident. You are not an accident. This whole world tells everybody you're an accident. Your birth was an accident. The fact that you're here is an accident. It's all a cosmic accident. The fact that you're alive right now is an accident. It's absurdity, absolutely absurd. Our God is an a, a incredibly creative God that designed each one of us. And each one of us are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're here for a purpose. You are not an accident. We are not an accident. God knows all times. And I want to I read this section. It's a very familiar one. But if you can, please turn to Ecclesiastes 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'm going to read through verse 11, 1 through 11. I love this passage. I love all these passages. This is a, a fun one to read, though, because it, it really gives... It gives a sense of God knows every moment. He knows everything that's going on. He knows when it's going to happen. He has a divine plan, and he has a purpose in everything. So Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1, it says, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under the heaven. A time to be born, and a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, and a time to heal. A time to break down, and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from beginning to the end. Do you hear that at the very end there, that passage? In verse 11, it says... Also, he has set the world in their hearts, that's our hearts, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from beginning to the end. There is a great mystery what God is doing through all of time, through all of history, through eternity. And that's God's divine plan. God has the secret things that he knows, and we live by the things that have been revealed to us. So it's just the truth. God is faithful to his divine plan, and we don't know that whole... We know parts of the plan, salvation of mankind, the establishment of the church, us as the children of God for eternity, but we don't know the whole plan. We're small. We're just creations. He's the creator. God's faithfulness to his divine divine plan should encourage us. When you think about that, that should encourage you. Our God is in absolute, utter control. He knows what's happening. It's his divine plan. He knows where it's going. And with all that, we have those great and precious promises where he's our father and we're his children, where he's going to show kindnesses to us for the ages to come. All those great and precious promises apply to us. And there's some divine plan that's going on for all of time and eternity. Uh, It's too big to really understand, to put your hands around, your thoughts around. But God is faithful to his divine plan. He's going to keep going where he's going, what he's doing. The next one, God is faithful. And this is the last one. God is faithful to his people. God is faithful to his people. He will never leave us nor forsake us. This might be an easy one to just point out, but this is part of his faithfulness. God is faithful to his holy character. He's faithful uh, 
to his salvation's plan. He's faithful to his divine plan. He's faithful to his word. And he's also faithful to his people. He will never leave us nor forsake us. That's in Hebrews 13, 5. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do to me. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, it says in verse 5. Also, he will not allow us to be tempted above that we are able. Here's another one. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He's faithful to us, his people. He will not allow us to be tempted above that we are able. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. He will not allow us to be tempted above that we are able. He's faithful. Also, and I only pointed out a few. There's so many, but these were some big ones I figured I'd point out. The Lord is near us when we are afflicted. Here's another one. When we are afflicted, and I think everyone will go through times where they'll be afflicted. We're promised persecution, suffering, affliction. Psalm 34, 17 through 20. I love these verses. It says, The righteous cry, and the Lord heareth, and delivereth them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. He keepeth all his bones, not one of them is broken. God is faithful. He is near us when we are afflicted. And there's so many more. I I won't go into any more, but God is faithful to his people. So with all that being said, and I'm going to end up stopping a little early tonight, but with all that being said, what I'm trying to point out is the sure foundation we have in God's faithfulness. We have a sure foundation, absolutely, utterly, because of God's faithfulness. Whatever comes, have faith in the faithfulness of God. Have faith in the faithfulness. He will be faithful to his holy character. He will not lie. He will not, I mean, he is holy. He's loving. He's just. He's righteous. He's pure. He will be faithful to that character. He will be faithful to his word. So take hold of those great and precious promises. Find them, read them, and live by them. Quote them to yourself. He will be faithful to salvation's plan. Our sure foundation is in Jesus Christ alone. That's never going to change. He will be faithful to his divine plan. There's some great plan going on. And God will be faithful to that plan. He will be faithful to his people. We're his people. There is also Israel, but we're his church. God will be faithful to his people. We may encounter the hard times in the future, but you hold on to the promises of God. You look to the holy character of God. If you don't have a promise that you can quote or a scripture you can quote out of it, turn back to the character of God. Sit on the character of God and who he is. Because he's true to that. Understand he is in control and he is faithful to his people. I think, and just this kind of a last thought here. For those Christians that are Christians longer, have been saved longer in their lives, I believe you can look back And you can see God's faithfulness more clearly than maybe the younger generations. You can see how God's been faithful to you. And the longer we live, the more trials and hardships we encounter. It's just part of living on this earth. You're going to encounter hard times. You're going to go through trials. You're going to have affliction, suffering, persecution. You're going to have financial troubles. All of those things offer the opportunity to see God's faithfulness. You realize it's in those hard times where you really often see God's faithfulness. He's faithful in the good times too. But it tends to get more in focus and more clear, or maybe we're looking for it more when we're going through those hard times. And anyone that's older and been saved longer, you've been through those hard times probably many times, and you've seen the faithfulness of God. I'm guessing most of this content tonight covered stuff you already knew. But I'm hoping when you leave tonight, you thank God for his faithfulness. His character. He's faithful to his character. And and that's my desire, is that you praise God, thank God for his character, his faithfulness, and that he is a holy God and he'll remain faithful to it. 
he showed such great kindness. Kindness that, that is beyond my understanding and description to me and to you. And it's because of his faithfulness to all those, those five different things I listed. His holy character, his word, salvation's plan, his divine plan, and faithfulness to his people. So if, if you just praise God and glorify God and thank God for being such a wonderful God. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, oh Lord, um, oh Father, you are uh, a faithful God. Lord, you're a kind God. And Lord, you exceed my words. Father, I don't have the words to contain your goodness, your greatness, your glory and holiness. Father, I, I'm a small creation and you're the creator. Father, you uh, exceed uh, everything I can say. Father, thank you for being a kind God and a faithful God. Lord, uh, I would ask, Lord, that you help us understand it more and think about it more, dwell on it more, Lord, for your glory, for your praise. Father, may the hearts of the people here uh, praise you more, love you more, glorify you more. Lord, thank you more. And Lord, uh, I just would ask that you help us share it with others, your faithfulness. Oh, Lord, there's so much truth in there about salvation, so much truth about your character that this world needs to know, that the lost in this world need to know. Father, help us be people that want to share who you are with others. Thank you, Lord, for, for being a faithful God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. With your heads.